Hey everybody, what is going on? Hexlex here. Got another Master Duel video for you. So, I wanted to play Punk again, um, but as I was building lists that use Punk as an engine, which I do very much like decks like that, I found myself really thinking that, yeah, it's not just like Punk as an engine, I want to play a, a Punk deck. So, um, I've been looking around at various Punk lists, and Initially, I thought that after the release of Dispater, that it might be more worth it to try, like, Bestials and Chaos stuff with, not just, again, Punk as an engine. When I say Punk as an engine, I'm referring to using, like, Xeomine and Deer Note and Foxy Tune to go into, like, a Chaos Ruler, right? And then using that to go get a bunch of mills. Typically, you would go into a Zombie Vampire after that, so on and so forth. Um, but... I'm referring more to Punk as like a deck, like uh, using more of the archetypes such as the other tuners, the field spell, um, and the amazing dragon as well, uh, actually intending to end on this card, although the set of games we're going to see were fairly atypical and I don't think I even summoned amazing dragon a single time, but uh, they were some very, very good games. So uh, I decided to come back to Cash Stira Punk because the more I thought about using the like kind of chaos stuff, like the Chaos Ruler and the Bestials with Punk, the more I kind of thought, yeah, I think that that style of deck is good, don't get me wrong, and I do also intend to play that style of deck uh, before the season is out as well. Um, but as far as like, you know, actually playing all of the Punk stuff, I still think that the Cash Stira monsters actually end up being uh, one of the best compliments to the deck, namely Fenrir and Unicorn. Uh, we're not playing a full Cash Stira package, as you might notice. Uh, it's just Fenrir, Unicorn, one of the field spell, and then the birth to grab off of Unicorn. Uh, I'm not including, like, Rise Heart or Theosis or a lot of the extra deck Cash Stira stuff, mostly because I do feel like those two strategies conflict with one another a little bit too much. I found when playing the extended cash package with Punk, uh, not just playing it personally, but also in games I've observed playing against people using the, that, the deck that is built that way, uh, is that you just have to make a decision pretty much every turn of like, okay, I can either make Cash Jira plays or Punk plays, which isn't inherently awful, like both lines are good, but I just don't like being locked into one or the other. And to be fair, you could do Punk plays and then if that gets disrupted, then you could like Special Unicorn and then add the Theosis, maybe, but that's a little bit situational. It would involve your plays not only being stopped, but also your board being cleared, which you can't guarantee would happen like every single time. So. It's like, I, at the end of the day, I think that, uh, like, Fenrir and Unicorn are both very good cards. Unicorn is a lot more generically splashable than I think some people realize, but it's not like you can put Unicorn in just about any deck that Fenrir goes to you. I find that using Unicorn to grab Birth and then using Unicorn as a material and then bringing it back is the best way to use it. So, um, really, it just involves a deck that can use Unicorn as a material. Here, obviously, we have the level 7 body. Paired with level 3 tuners means we can just go into, like, a level 10 synchro monster, right? Actually, you know, looking at this list and thinking about it some more, I think this might not even be any different. <laughs> and I was actually thinking about this when I built the deck, too. I was looking at the list, and I'm like, I think, I haven't even checked yet, but I think this might be the exact same 40-card main deck that I played last time I covered this deck, which... Wasn't intentional, if it is true, I don't even know right now. Um, but if it does happen to be the case, I think that just is, you know, good evidence that I think this is a solid 40 card cash punk list. Um, I think you could definitely take this list to ladder and do very well with it. Actually, this was another instance that we're going to see in the games coming up where um, the four games that we're going to see are like just the first four games that I played with this deck. So we'll go ahead and watch all of those in a row uh, and you can see how well this deck performs in like any given isolated set of games right there. Um, as far as the extra deck goes, it's... I want to say it's standard, but at the same time, Punk doesn't really have a standard extra deck because it's super duper wide open. As far as what you have to have, right, um, I would say you you have to have one Rising Carp, you have to have the Jam Dragon Drive, you got to have Baron and another 10, Shenging being the best one, um, that's also very generic. You only need one Amazing Dragon, I like to, because you can definitely go into this on turn 1 and still make a second on your opponent's turn. Uh, we got Pep, that's definitely mandatory. Um, I would say Zeus and at least one thing to summon it is mandatory. And that's kind of it, though. So that's one, two, three. I'll be generous and say four, five, six. Again, I'll be a little generous and include fortune tune here. Seven, eight. 
So even of the cards that I say you need to have, and including a couple that I think are a little generous, that's still only eight cards, uh, leaving this extra deck wide open. So how I like to fill it out is various level eight synchros for different situations, right? Uh, Adam Emancipator Risen Dragite is good, uh, not only for being able to, well, we actually don't even have Nibiru, so I was gonna say we can maybe seek in a bounce every, like, 50 games or so, but no Nibiru, so no bouncing, but we do have the Rising Carp that'll send itself to the yard and is a water monster, so if you need a level 8 that can negate spell or trap cards, you can summon this one. Uh, Draco Berserker is very, very good through punching through a lot of, uh, different kinds of boards with its battling effect, and also the effect to banish monsters that activate their effects are... Uh, that's a very relevant effect too. Just know that this does not negate the effect. It just banishes the monster that activated it. Then Cypher and Lord Omega, in case you need to do a little bit of hand ripping. Um, the other level 8 synchro I was kind of thinking about including was like Chaos Ruler anyway, even though we're not a dedicated deck, like, you know, towards that kind of strategy. But it's like, what are we going to grab? Foxy Tune or Ogre Dance? If we're already summoning a level 8 synchro, we don't need these cards anymore. So I'm like, yeah, you know, it doesn't really add anything, I think, to this style of a punk deck. Oh, we're also playing the Cashier Arise Heart. Not that I'm intending to like overlay three level seven monsters, as you can see, it's not even really that feasible for me to do that unless I like, you know, unicorn and birth, and then set up the birth and like bring back multiple things with birth over a couple of turns. Uh, this is mainly in here in case I'm up against the Cashier matchup. They activate their era, then I can use one of my monsters to just go into a Rise Heart off of one material if I need to. Also, we are playing Triple Tactics Talent, so again, stealing the opponent's cash monsters once era has been activated and then overlaying it into the Rise Heart is also a possibility as well. Uh, normally, I don't include extra deck options that are that niche, but again, uh, with Punk, your extra deck is so wide open, it's like you can afford to include this kind of thing. So, uh, Also, Asa, the Earth Charmer Immovable, this card is fantastic in this deck, particularly for going into the Underworld Goddess when you need to. Um, Asa is great because, uh, obviously, not only for putting material bodies on your board for going into the Goddess, but there are a lot more Earth monsters to steal than you may think. Uh, Maxi, of course, being the big one to, again, build up enough materials on board to go into Goddess. This can also take opposing Fenrirs, though, which is one of the main reasons why I love including it in the extra deck. Also, of course, if you really need to uh, and you have, like, no other plays, uh, you can summon this out and have, like, run it into something, have it get destroyed by battle, and then be able to search, like, a Xeomine or a Durno or whatever you need to, like, make plays moving forward. Deer Note might have sound like a weird kind of addition to all that, but the thing about Deer Note is it's actually not that bad to have in hand a lot of the time uh, because of its ability to help you extend um, just by summoning itself or, again, just something else in your hand. So I don't mind playing two. I can definitely understand why people play one. And to be fair, in a deck without Chaos Ruler, you definitely don't need to. You can definitely just play the one. But um, the other problem is, though, if you only play one and you open this, then you have a really hard time doing some of your combo lines, so, um, I prefer to, again, it's just safer, and it's not the worst thing in the world at all to open with this, so. Okay, I think that covers pretty much everything I wanted to talk about regarding this list, so let's go ahead and break it down card by card, and then we will see those games. Uh, we are on three Maxi, one Ghost Ogre and a Snow Rabbit, three Ash Blossom and a Joy Spring, one Yukio Punk Shark Usai, one Gagaku Punk Wagon, one Jorari Punk Madam Spider, three No Punk Xeomine, two No Punk Deer Note, two Cashier Fenrir, three Cashier Unicorn, three No Punk Foxy Tune, three No Punk Ogre Dance, two Triple Tactics Talent, one Punk Jam Extreme Session, one Pressured Planet Rates Off, one Cashier of Birth, two Emergency Teleport, a two Called by the Grave, one Cross Out Designator, three Infinite Impermanence, and then one Jewelry Punk Nashiwari Surprise. Uh, and that'll be our main deck. For the extra deck, we're on one Yu Gi Oh! Punk Rising Carp, one Cyframe Lord Omega, one Draco Berserker of the Tenny, one Ad Emancipator Risen Dragite, one Punk Jam Dragon Drive, one Baron de Fleur, one Sword Soul Supreme Sovereign Shengyang, uh, two Yukio Punk Amazing Dragon, one Psychic and a Punisher, one Number 49 Fortune Tune, one Kashira Arise Heart, one Divine Arsenal Ah Zeus Sky Thunder, one Asa the Earth Charmer Immovable, one Underworld Goddess of the Closed World. Uh, and that'll wrap up our list. Let's go ahead and see those games. 
So like I said in the profile, uh, these four games, this first one being against Zodiac, uh, I just played these four in a row. These are the first four I played, and they were all actually pretty decent games. So uh, we're going to show them in the order I played them in, uh, the first one honestly being one of the more simple ones. Uh, again, we're going second here against Zodiac. They're going to lead with the Dimension Shifter. Um, you know, makes sense because they want to get stuff in the yard. Activating the Fire Formation Tenki as a follow-up. I'm going to Ash Boss in this. Um, it is fairly likely that they'll have either a Zodiac in hand or Barrage, but I want to Ash Boss on the Tenki anyway on the off chance that they're not able to have anything else to follow up with because having played Zodiac a decent bit, I definitely know from experience how much worse your hand gets when you don't have a Zodiac monster, even if you already have Cash Tira stuff. So I figure even if my opponent drops like a Unicorn or a Fenrir and just starts doing Cash plays, I still have a couple of Imperms and I should be able to bounce back. All right, Ash Blossom is going to negate the ten key opponents going to set and then pass, so they actually did not end up having anything else in hand, which is very good for me. Going to draw the Sharkusai, which will be enough to make plays here. Uh, I'm going to lead with the Fenrir. Fenrir effects you add the Unicorn, uh, even though I don't really have any plans to summon a Unicorn here. Of course, we still want to just get the Fenrir on the board and for extra damage, extra body, etc. Normal summoning the Sharkusai. Okay, here my opponent's going to make a pretty baffling decision, frankly, <laughs> in my opinion. They're flipping Imperial Iron Wall, which says neither player can banish cards. Now, you might have remembered that earlier, in fact, as their first action for their turn, my opponent activated Dimension Shifter, which says that any card since the graveyard is banished instead. Um, I don't know if my opponent maybe didn't know about the interaction between the two, or... I don't know, I just, I, I'm not really sure what was going on here. Um, but this will cause all my stuff to go to the graveyard, by the way. Um, also, I wanted to point this out to you. I, my opponent did not need to activate Dimension Shifter right when they did. Um, Dimension Shifter has the requirement of having no cards in the graveyard, but as you can see, my opponent didn't activate any cards that would have put a card in their graveyard anyway. Even if I hadn't Ash Blossom the Tenki and they'd gone into the Zodiacs, that still would not have put anything in the graveyard. Uh, it just would have been, yeah, the Zodiacs on the field stacked on top of each other. Now, granted, if they wanted to use Dryden's effect, they would have to fire off Shifter first, but I don't think that's that big of a deal. Um, or just wait until my turn to fire off Shifter. Maybe they did it on their turn because on their next follow-up turn, they don't want stuff to get banished, which would make sense if they plan to use the combo line that summons back Ram Ram from the graveyard, but it's just, it's odd to me that after I summon a Punk Monster and show you that I'm not just a dedicated Cashier deck, then you would flip up Imperial Iron Wall, but... In any case, I've got the other Punk Monster in hand to fuse with, so I'm just going to fuse the Shark Kusai with the Druno, going into our Yukio Punk Rising Carp. Rising Carp F is activating to summon out the Xeomine, and then my opponent concedes. Well, not Xeomine, I think I would get Wagon. Wagon Druno. Actually, would I get Xeomine? I think I would... Well, I wouldn't have to get Xeomine. Well, I mean, it, whatever. I'm just going for lethal here. I just have to get 5,600 points of worth of attack points on the board to pair with the 2,400 my Fender has for 8k, which should not be difficult uh, once you resolve the Rising Carp. So, yeah, uh, that was the first two we played in. Um, and looking at the opponent's list, they did have a lot of what I would call sideboard cards, uh, like the Imperial Iron Wall that we saw. Um, the sh they're playing like Shadow Imprisoning Mirror as well. Um, I've said this before, I'll say it again. Don't don't main deck a card in Master Duel that you would side deck in best of three. It's 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 going to cause you to lose games, not win them. Um, but yeah, there is that first duel. Let's go ahead into the next one now. Okay, second game that we are going to be showing is up against Monadium. Very, very cool deck. God, I love Monadium. It's it's been so far this season, it's been my like go-to like downtime sort of deck here. Whereas in when I'm not playing a deck for like a channel or the channel or a video or a stream or something, I'm usually just playing a little bit of Monadium or something. Anyway, we're going second. We have Ash Blossom and Imperm again, as well as Cashier Unicorn and Etelly. The second Unicorn is a little less than ideal. Okay, I want to talk about this. I misplayed this Ash Blossom hugely here. Um, don't do it on Lightheart. Wait for the Primitive Planet Reich Phobia, because they could very easily have it in hand. Also, like, if I think... I don't know. I, I definitely, when I was actually playing this game, was too focused on the idea of this being a Scareclaw deck. I should have considered that it was Monadium. If I consider that it's Monadium, they definitely have better... Um, choke points with the Ash Blossom. Also, if it's still Scareclaw, I could still wait with the Ash Blossom again for the Field Spell, which I should have, or even for, like, um, uh, Try Hearts effect or something. I don't know. It's like there are... I, I could have played this Ash Blossom much, much better, especially given that it's going to end up proccing a Triple Tactics Talent. 
which will rip my imperm. Which I was a little bit anxious when I saw that because I was like, oh wait, the fact that they didn't take Italian Imperm means they're definitely gonna combo. And yeah, they have Meek plus Rimheart, which just is a full combo by itself, in addition to everything else they've already played. So we're definitely gonna see them drop a full board on us here. And in fact, honestly, most of the reason I didn't want to show this game is so that, you know, you don't make the same mistakes I do. Um, yeah, I, it's something I talk about a lot, and it's it's not always something I... I don't always practice what I preach when I should. <laughs> but um, being mindful of when you use your disruption is so, so critical. Um, there are a lot of people who think that, oh, if I have an Ash Blossom against Branded, then I auto-win. Um, well, that's a bad example, because we always use Ash Blossom against Branded Fusion, but it's like... You know, people might think, like, oh, if I just Ash Blossom, you know, whatever, then Meek or something, I can auto-win. Um, but, you know, there are a lot of hands, or I guess in this particular state, you know, even if I had Ash Blossom the right Phobia, they would have still triple tacked, ripped the Imperm from my hand, and still had Vizus in hand as well. Their hand was actually just like, uh, or no, did they add the Vizus off the Calarium, right? Yeah, yeah, they added it, okay. I was gonna say, like, was their hand actually just perfect? I mean, it still kinda was, honestly, opening the, uh, the rim plus the meek. Very, very good, but... Okay, here, meek plus Astrolad are gonna end up making the Sheng Ying. Dispater bringing back the Rykart, and then going for their second Vicious Astrolad, which, with the Rykart and Cross Sheep, will make... The Appalooza. So, three Monster Renegades, four actually including the Pater. Well, the Pater is just a monster kind of disrupts. It's a destroyer right now because I don't have anything to banish. We have the Omni and the Shengang to deal with here. Zamin, definitely not a bad top deck. The second Unicorn definitely needs to be something more useful, though. I'm going to lead by specialing the Unicorn and activating the effect. This will get me negated by the Appalooza, but it also makes the Appalooza uh, able to be battled over now, which is good. Oxfade the other effect too, just because at this point it doesn't really matter and I might draw out another monster in the gate, which I do, so Apple is going down to 800 now. Itali, I'm pretty sure yep, this is going to eat the Baron Omni negate. And now I can normal summon Zayamine, but I still have a bit of a problem here, right? Even if I do normal summon Zayamine, which is that I can't activate the effect. If I do, Dispater is going to destroy it. Although, you know, maybe would that be the worst thing in the world? Like, I would have been able to add Foxy Tune. Foxy Tune Pitch Unicorn for... That's the thing, right? Like, does adding one of the other tuners really help me that much? I don't know. I kind of don't think so. Also, they do still have the Appalooza up, so they could just negate anyway, and it's like, you know... Like, if they negate Foxy Tune, and then just kind of screwed anyway, I guess is what I mean. Although, I could have battled first, main phase two, activate, this destroys, but it doesn't negate, so I add Foxy Tune. Oh, and then I could have Foxy Tune Pitch Unicorn made Baron, Baron pop their Baron, but we still just get, or Baron pop their Pater, but no, then their stuff still just battles over us. So, what I ended up doing was actually sinking the Xamine and Unicorn without acting Xamine's effects for my own Sheng Yang, but unfortunately, this doesn't really do much as far as letting me get over their board. Yeah, I don't really think there was any way over this, but like, Ah, uh, the second Unicorn. The second Unicorn could have been so many different cards that I think might have been able to help me get there. And also keep in mind that we lost that Imperm to, the, to their Triple Tactics talent. That Imperm would have definitely changed the course of this duel, too. Yeah, but, um, you know, I wanted to show this because it, our opponent, Mika, here, definitely played their hand very, very well. Um, and, yeah, I mean... I did not play my Ash Blossom well, and I think that one of the best ways to uh, teach situations like that is by example. So definitely be mindful of when you're shotgunning your disrupts. Uh, keep in mind stuff like the fact that, you know, Lightheart is just searching another card that will search another card. They could have a copy of that in hand anyway, so you should Ash Blossom the second search because, you know, it doesn't really make that much of a difference in the long run anyway. And also on top of that, um, just being mindful of your mashups, right? Like, again, in this case, I saw Scareclaw cards. I assumed I was playing Scareclaw, which was so foolish of me as a Monadium, as someone who plays Monadium, right? I should have thought about Monadium too, but I just didn't in that moment. So, um, just being mindful. This is a game that definitely demonstrates how important it is to be mindful. This game could have been winnable if I had played it better. Um, but we still have a couple more games to check out. Let's go into those here.
Alright, for those of you who stuck around in the latter half, these two games, I'm not going to lie, there's some pretty good back and forths here. Uh, this game that we're about to go into right now is against Mikanko. Uh, I lost the coin flip here, but they let me have the first turn, so I was like, okay, it's Mikanko or Nubron, probably, it's one of those two. I guess there's a world, there's a universe where it could be Cyber Dragon as well, but... So... I lead with the cashier stuff just to see if I can bait Nash Blossom. None of that, but the opponent does have a max C here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to add the Madam Spider off the Ogre Dance because they chained the max C to the Ogre Dance. Also, also, um, you might have noticed that I led with the Fenrir and not the Right Soth. Normally, I would lead with Right Soth, see if they Ash Blossom it then summon the Fenrir. Um, especially in this case, it wouldn't even matter if they had Droll because I have the Fenrir in hand anyway. But when the game started, even though I had the first turn, I saw Priority briefly pass over to my opponent before back to me. So what this kind of told me is that it was more likely than not that my opponent had Max C. Um, and in that case, I wanted to get the Fenrir summon out as my first action before my opponent had a chance to get pa uh, priority pass then during my main phase and be able to activate max C. So that's why I summoned Fenrir and then activated Raid Soth. Normally I would do it the other way around, but again, because I suspected they had max C, I did it in the Fenrir first and I'm very glad I did. Uh, now I can summon this Madam Spider, activate the effect for the surprise. Uh, Fenrir, we'll just add another Fenrir because why not? Set the surprise and then pass the opponent. So. I decided not to go into Baron here because I was faced with two options. Uh, I knew I was going to get the Madam Spider to grab the Nashiwari surprise pretty much no matter what. Um, and I wanted to also be able to use it to destroy a face-up card on the opponent's turn. So kind of the options I ended up left with were, okay, I could leave the board as is. Uh, I have the Fenrir Banish, the Nashiwari can pop a face-up card, and my opponent doesn't get a draw. If I go for Baron, yes, I have an Omni Negate. But now, not only can this not pop a face-up card, I also give my opponent a draw on top of that. If I think they're a deck like Makako and Numeron, where every single draw is going to super matter, um, I think this is definitely the better way to go. Also, I think it's the better way to go anyway, because being able to pop a face-up card is super important for being able to hit equip spells if it's Mikanko, or the field spell if it's Numeron. So, that's why I played out my turn one the way I did there. Now they have a Lava Golem and a Harpy's Feather Duster, so it's not going to matter anyway, but... <laughs> I wanted to demonstrate why I played my turn the way I did. Um, which, I think I did play it correctly. My opponent just had Lava Golem, Duster, which, you know, for a deck that chooses to go second, that's definitely not atypical, so. Yeah, here they do reveal that they are on Mikanko, uh, sending the Mikanko Dance, and that will let them bring back the Huli, which will prevent the targeting from happening, so. Uh, thankfully, they can only do 6k. It's not lethal here. They do have a set card before passing it back over to me. Wagon, excellent draw there. Although we do have the Ogre Dance anyway, which I'm going to start by firing off here for the Zayamine. But if I didn't have Ogre Dance, that Wagon would have saved me with that draw. I'm going to normal summon Zayamine. Uh, they're going to use the Mikanko Rivalry to equip and then steal the Lava Golem to prevent me from going into Psychic and Punisher. Uh, I will, to be fair though, uh, Psychic and Punisher would not have helped me here. The reason that Pep wouldn't have helped me is because uh, Psychic and Punisher, although it would have massive attack points, uh, one, I can't even use the effect to pay a thousand and banish stuff, two, even if I could, it targets and their cards cannot be targeted, so. Gonna make an Asa with the Deer Note. Deer Note bringing back Ogre Dance, Asa stealing their Maxi, and now, as I talked about in the profile, I can use their Lava Golem with the Asa and their Maxi to go for the Underworld Goddess. This will allow me to negate their monsters. Uh, they're gonna have to fire off their uh, Ritual Monsters effect right now. Yep, they're doing it now, uh, while well, they still can. Now they can still bring back this equip and steal my Goddess, which is very scary. Or at least it would be if I didn't have Kashira monsters in hand, so. I can just special Unicorn, Unicorn F to add the Birth. I do have a Fenrir in my graveyard, by the way, so Birth can bring back the Fenrir. Fenrir F to add my one of my last Unicorns. I think I have one more left in there, and now I can battle. Uh, now, I did misplay here. I should have battled with the Huli first and not the Ritual Monster, for a reason we'll see in a moment. 
Fender is going to battle over the Ohime, and this will proc the Equip Spell effect. So yeah, if I had not misplayed, if I just battled over this first, this would have gone to the graveyard, and then my opponent would have a clear field. Granted, they are still in a top deck mode, because uh, Underworld Goddess negates the monsters permanently. It's not just until the end of the turn. Um, yeah, this card is like summoned. You can negate the effects of all face-up monsters your opponent currently controls, period. That means this will not be getting its effects back when it comes back to my opponent's turn. So I'm going to have to hope they don't top anything. And fortunately for me, they, not only do they not, but it doesn't seem like they knew about Underworld Goddess. Yeah, only negating for... Uh, or not only negating for the one turn, but being a permanent negation as they ran it right into the Fenrir. So it ended up working out. Granted, if I had played it well... Okay, let's be honest. If I had read my opponent's cards, <laughs> which is playing it well, by the way, uh, if I had read my opponent's cards and played it well, then my opponent would have been in complete top deck mode and probably conceded anyway. Um, but I guess to be fair, it didn't end up mattering that much. I don't, I don't know enough about Makanko to know if there's a world where leaving the negated monster and that equip spell on the field actually matters, but it might have. But thankfully for us, it didn't here. So. We have one more duel to see, and I'm not going to lie, it's like one of the better back and forths I've had in a while, so let's go into that. Alright, here we're going to have an 8 turn mirror match. I actually thought about leading with this video, with this or this duel at the start of the video, because it's, honestly, it's a, it's a pretty good game. But you know, I, I always do that, and it's like, I want to leave, leave a treat for those of you who stick around to the very end. Alright, they're going to lead with the Raid South, I will Ash Blossom it here. Um... I think I would probably do this anyway, even if I didn't have an Imperm in my hand. Uh, but the Imperm in hand definitely makes me a lot more confident using the Ash Blossom here. But uh, Ash Blossom and Imperm can be kind of weird about when you want to use them against Kashira, right? Because um, if you stop the field spell search, there's always a chance that you stop their plays altogether. It's probably safer to wait for the Theosis, generally speaking. Again, I was fine using it here. Um, because I have the Imperm. Also, Raid South does not mean they are a dedicated Kashira deck, as a lot of decks that splash Fenrir will also tend to splash this to search it as well. So, that's the other reason why I'm like, I don't know. It's like, it's so. Maybe Raid South isn't good to Ash Boss, and maybe I should have just waited. Indeed, I could have hit the Ogre Dance here, but. I don't know. It's so iffy. So iffy when it comes to Kashira cards. Uh, thankfully, though, like I said, we do have the Imperm as well, so I'm just gonna use the Imperm on my opponent's side, say, I mean. They do have a Psychic Wielder, interesting tech, that they're going to end up overlaying into the number 49 of Fortune Tune before just passing. Oh, by the way, for those who wonder why we use a rank 3 Zeus Pilot without Downward Magician, uh, the reason to do that with Fortune Tune is because uh, in order to survive battle, this card has to detach one material anyway. So if you end up detaching material from this and then sack a Downward and then go into Zeus, it's only three materials Zeus anyway. So it's like... The vast majority of the time this ends up being your Zeus pilot, um, the downer doesn't make enough of a difference to be worth the extra deck slot. Now, granted, the extra deck is still super wide open, so you could definitely still play downer anyway if you want to, or play a different rank 3 and use downer as well, but uh, Fortune Tune has the ability to, again, protect itself from being destroyed by the battle or card effect, and also can't be targeted, so that makes it a pretty good Zeus pilot. Uh, here I'm going to end up setting the Birth and the Triple Tack, Although, maybe I should have said the birth. I, might, I kind of regretted that slightly, but the reason I set these set of these. The reason I set these as bluffs is because I wanted to bait my opponent into Zeus. And they actually did. I didn't think they were going to, but they did actually use the Zeus effect on their turn to eat my back rows, which is so good for me. Uh, Madam Spider is not the worst top deck in the world, because I can at the very least search the trap card and then use it to destroy the Zeus on the follow up turn here. Which I'm going to wait until they go to battle phase to do that. Uh, that way, in case they have follow-up plays, they can't just, like, you know, OTK me. They have a Xamine. We have an Ash Blossom, our second one. So we're once again stopping their plays. It's a very, very back-and-forth game here. We're just constantly disrupting one another. We're really also I'm just waiting to draw, like, an actual decent card here. Ghost Ogre and Star Rabbit will actually be enough. I'm going to overlay the two of these into the Fortune Tune. Oh, no, 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 I was going to do that. That was my original plan, was to go into Fortune Tune. But then I realized, wait a second, I can do better than that. Because this is a mirror match, I can summon Asa and steal their Zayamine and activate its effect. 
Uh, this will take an Ash Blossom from them. Um, or cause them to use an Ash Blossom, rather. But I'm going to just use the Triple Attack now and take their Zamine and just go with my original plan of just making a Zeus here. So I could have drawn two, but I figured this was the less risky line. Because I would have had to have drawn, like, pretty much exactly Foxy Tune in order to actually, like, be able to continue my plays here, I think. So... So yeah, we'll just go into Fortune Tune battle directly, and to be fair, this is a situation where a downer would have let me have extra material, but my opponent's last card is Nibiru! It's Nibiru! Now, granted, the token's gonna have 3k defense, so they can't just run it over, uh, although the card they peel off the top, it's a Kaiju! <gasps> it's a fucking Kaiju, oh my god. So now we're like in top deck mode, a true top deck battle, our opponent's top deck was very good, However, the heart of the cards is a little bit more on my side here. As I rep E-Tally, the actual literal best top deck in my whole deck here. We can E-Tally for Zayamine. Zayamine F will add the Sharakusai. I can almost summon Sharakusai, Fuse for the Rising Carp, and then my opponent concedes because it's a mirror match. They know. They know what I'm able to do from here on out, and they know that I am able to secure the W. Whoo! I had to include that game because, oh my god, I have not had that kind of a back and forth, like, top deck war that led into a heart of the cards moment like that in quite a while. And, and again, these four games that we saw were just the first four that I played with this deck, which that very rarely happens too. So, yeah, very, very exciting game. Again, I usually like to lead with exciting games, but, you know... Um, those of you who stick around to the end, like, that, like, watching the whole video, like, makes so much of a difference, and it's like, you know, look, let's, let's have an, let's have an incentive to watch the end of the video, <laughs> you know, so it's like, um, wanted to give that to you all there, but, yeah, thank you everybody who did watch this far, that, again, it, it means a lot, like, it, it's a very, very good way to support, and also just, yeah, the fact that you actually like watching my stuff, <laughs> still blows my mind, it really does, but, uh, that'll do it for this video, let us move now to our outro. All right, everybody, that's going to do it for this video. Thank you for watching all the way to the very end. That means a whole lot to me, and it's also a fantastic way to support the channel. And if you're interested in supporting the channel in other ways besides YouTube, there are plenty of ways to do that. If you check out the description below, you'll find a bunch of links down there. One of them goes to my Patreon. You're actually seeing the names of everyone subscribed to the Patreon on the screen right now. So if you're interested in getting your name in the credits here at the end, if you want to see more daily Master Duel content, or if you're interested in one-on-one -on -one private coaching sessions, I offer all of that on Patreon. I also stream live on Twitch. Feel free to go ahead and click that link and follow and or subscribe there. I also have the Discord community if you want to follow that link where hundreds of duelists have already signed up. Free to join and you can just come hang out, talk about the game, and chill in general. The final link that's going to be in the description is my Twitter. You can follow that if you want some more notifications of what's happening with the channel. So all in all, thank you all so much for watching and I hope you have a fantastic day.